Hello and welcome to the bonus season. Uh, just a quick, quick heads up. Some audio issues in this episode. We're uh, learning how to include guests into our episodes, and um, there were issues beyond my thoughts and precautions on uh, how to record everybody's audio well. So it's not perfect, but it's a pretty cool conversation. So I stick around. Oh my God! It is one one one. Wow! Make a and wish, I, guys. I, I just wow! That's incredible. <laughs> we, I've been noticing some really good times, and it is Sunday, April twenty third, and that was the the East Coast time. So that means it's what time? It's you're at ten ten eleven right now. Who so, me? Yeah, he's at ten. Yeah, and you're at eleven eleven. I'm at eleven eleven. Wow! Oh. Oh, no. Angel numbers. No. Let's go. Easy. Wait, so where are you coming from? I'm from Laramie, Wyoming. Oh, right on. Is that where you are right now? Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, that's where I've been living. That's I just bought a house out here, actually. Oh, congratulations, <laughs> Boo! Thank you. Yeah. Wow. How do you like the new place? I love it. I say I haven't moved in yet. That's what you yeah. caught me doing right before, doing like all this paperwork before the meeting. Because, yeah. yeah, it's crunch time now with all that. Very good, very I'm, good. I'm so happy for you. Right? Thank you. Since we started this podcast, you've been on the hunt, and mm-hmm. I've been on the hunt before that. But um, yeah, that, that rocks, man! Congratulations. Yeah, thank That's you. A huge step. Nice, 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 nice. You're gonna have like a little podcasting room. Oh yeah, I, I've already got like plans for it. I'm getting it set yes, up. It's gonna laboratory. look great. Yeah. The laboratory. All right. Well, that's incredible. Well, it seems like a just a blessed day in my book. Well, Stu, thanks for being our first guest on the podcast. This is like big. No worries. Before, and what a guest we have. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll start with a little context on how, how we bumped into each other. Um, the continuation of the Camp Thunderbird connection continues to rule my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, in a surprisingly good way. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we so we ran into each other in Idaho. What town was that? Grangeville, Idaho. Idaho. Rainsville, Idaho. Yeah. We were um, we were front country camping with the kids. I think right before we went to the, the Salt Tooth Reservation, and uh, we know you you were out there fighting wildfires, being the uh, wonderful smoke jumper that you are. Uh, uh, hell attack. attack. <laughs> oh <laughs> shit! Got a little, little minor, minor correction. correction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, work okay. at, we work at an air center. Air center. Uh-huh. And so we work with smoke jumpers, uh-huh. not directly. I mean, we'll see them on incidents, yeah. but we are actually part of the helicopter side of the air center. Incredible. So we just fly there in a helicopter and land. Just oh, yeah, okay. this is small, yeah, a little, little difference there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't want to. I can't claim to be anything that you're not in this industry. People are very, uh, very cagey about their. Uh, what they're bringing to the table, you know, their sure. role that they have in the business. Yeah. Well, yeah. By, all, by all means. By all means. <laughs> well, as usual, I do as, uh, as much research before every episode to make sure that uh, we nail it. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> no, false facts here. no, it's all good, dude. It's the same thing. We're all getting there. We're just getting there the same different ways, you know? Yeah. We're all doing the same thing. It's just a different aerial resource for firefighters. Word, word, word. Doing the same shit. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, we saw Stu there, saw him doing the good work contributing society in a way that we don't have the guts to do, and uh, figured we ought to cook him dinner. And uh, so him, me and the boys, we, we had a lovely meal together and just talk, talk, talked our little, little uh, ears off. You guys had a whole feast. Like, yeah, we made a big last feast. supper. We like, worked like, that camp under very much. 40 pounds of food, dude. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, what did burgers, corn. Oh, yeah. my God. Guac. Yeah, we made a freaking feast. We we turned up. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that was so funny. 
And um, yeah, and Stu just graciously is totally about 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 the mission of spreading the good word of uh, preserving the planet. Woo! Ooh, we love it. Yeah, yeah. So, hell, let's get right into it. Um, uh, Stu, let's. Uh, why don't I, you kind of gave us a little description about your job? But why don't you uh, kind of give us a, a day in the life of Stu Stewart on incident? Okay. Um... Well, I, it would depend on whether or not you're attached to a large fire or if you're just mm -hmm. at home at your base. But essentially what I've been doing for the last couple of seasons is I've been on a helitac crew. So our role is in a light helicopter, a Bell 407. Basically mm -hmm. what we would do is kind of hang out, pay attention to the weather. And if a fire starts somewhere on our forest, uh, we would respond to it if that's what the overhead deems is the best resource to respond to that particular fire. So why is a helicopter a good idea? Well, if you have a lightning strike that started a tree way in the middle of boonies, like in the middle of nowhere, and it doesn't make sense to try and drive a truck out near it and then hike people into it, if we can land a helicopter near it, we're going to use the helicopter. So we would get called to a very remote lightning strike, let's say, we fly out there, take a look at it um, from the air, decide whether or not we're going to engage it, and that would be kind of the manager's side. As a firefighter, I'm the lowest man on the totem pole in the helicopter. Um, if they deem that it's something we're going to do and everybody feels good about it, we'll land near the fire, we'll hike to it, and then we'll begin suppression operations. And so sometimes that just looks like digging a little line around the fire to make sure that it doesn't spread it anymore. And then also using uh, maybe the helicopter for buckets. So if there's a nearby water source, we can go pick up water and then dump it on our little fire for us. And then basically we'll just camp on it for a few days and mop it up and just churn soil and make sure that the cold stuff is mixed with the hot stuff. It's that simple. And then once that's all done and it's dead, then, uh, You'll call it out to dispatch and uh, hike off to the nearest road where you get picked up by a truck, or maybe the helicopter will come back and get you. Um, that's kind of part of our role that we would do yeah. if we were on forest um, yeah. in that Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest in Idaho. If we were off forest and we were attached to a large incident, say mm -hmm. we were in California mm -hmm. or we were in Arizona, um, and we were attached to a large fire down there, we might be doing more logistical support, like building giant nets full of stuff and flying them out to people um, mm -hmm. in remote parts of the fire that would yeah. otherwise resupply would be more difficult via truck. Um, so our roles kind of change depending on whether or not we're near our home base or whether or not we're on the road. So That's cool. I, does Let's that kind of answer your question? Bit. Uh, yeah, it sounds like you're like a pretty dynamic asset of like aerial support. Whether yeah. that means you're going to go on the ground and you're going to fight that fire, or you're going to be able to support that other crew. The kind of the grounding aspect is, is the aircraft. Mm -hmm. that, is that is correct. Is yeah, yeah. typically like when we're engaging a fire, it's usually on the smaller side because we're only two people getting off in like mm. usually the middle of the boonies. You know, oh, that's miles sick. nowhere. Dude, it's radical. Yeah, because yeah. you're yeah. flying out yeah. like. Some little lightning strike out there, and it's deep, you know. Yeah. Um, and then it's just you and one other person. So it can get a little, it can get a little nerve wracking sometimes because if anything were to go wrong, you know, it's just you and one other person. So it's like, you know, like take your time, go slow, try not to get injured. Um, yeah, for sure. It's great. We love it. <laughs> Camp out in the middle of the woods. Yeah, that's what it's all about, right? That's all we're all about. Yeah, dude. That's why it's time camping. Cool. Right. How, long, how, long, how long are you usually on an incident? Like, what are, what are your, what's your schedule like out there? So, if so we're doing, we're like, doing a like, like a little, little fire, fire, like I was like mentioning, mentioning, like a local IA, and the, the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the acronym IA, but it stands for no. initial attack. So, so, if you're doing it a local IA, and you, so initial attack, you are initially responding to the fire, you could be out there for, uh, two, three, five days, depending on how long uh, you're tied into that and uh, whether or not you need to be relocated to a different fire or get back to staff 
the mm-hmm. helicopter back at home. Um, basically, there's a lot of different factors that determine whether or not you'll be tied into a fire for a set amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're on a large incident support, so you've been dispatched to a large fire somewhere in the western United States, yeah. um, typically you're going to be looking at a 14-day assignment. And so you'll be on 14 days off three. So you go, respond, travel's not included, work 14 days straight, travel back, and then you get three days off. Wow. And so that typically happens, you know, depending on your resource, three mm-hmm. to five times a summer. Yeah. How, how does that feel going out for 14 days? Because I generally just try and work four days a week or else I uh, start to get pretty cranky. Yeah. <laughs> I refuse to work full time. You're absolutely right, man. I I get it. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like that's one of those things where it's like you get to know people like yeah re- a little too well, you know. Sure. Like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Brothers in arms at that point. <laughs> yeah, dude. And like if you're if the way I look at this job, like yeah, yeah, you're stuck with these people, and if you get along with them, it's the easiest job in the world, and it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It is yeah, great, yeah. but if you're with somebody who you don't yeah. quite mess with, it could be a long, like two or three days yeah. Like, yeah. stuck straight in the middle of nowhere with somebody. So, uh, oh. it needs to be with like a good, solid crew of people, you know? Yeah. 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 I'm thinking about like, yeah, like you work retail or something back way back, and it's like you have to spend eight hours with that one guy, and it's like, oh, what a terrible eight hours of my life, but you're. You're freaking in it. And so you have to in live it. with that person. You're also like need that guy, like relying on that person for your life too. It's like making sure they're making good calls. Yeah. 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 Do you, do you ever yeah. Do you end up like with some like salty dogs out there like I feel like that could attract <laughs> You know, every so often, like maybe you're like on a fishing vessel, you just kind of get those people who have just been through it all, and now they're just there. Yeah, yeah. yeah there are definitely salty dogs, as you put. It. That's a good way to put it. There's yeah. some, yeah. uh, there's some attitudes in that industry that are, yeah. you yeah. know, less than desirable. But yeah. that's yeah. that's like, there there are assholes everywhere you go. You know, yeah, and everybody's got to like. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're able to like uh, to navigate that, yeah. you know, like on an interpersonal level, and just know how to to kind of uh, work with those types of people. At least I don't know. That's that's kind of yeah, how I yeah. look at it. Like you don't no, have that's, to be that's a real. friend, you know. No. Like you just, you need to be coworkers. Friendship's definitely the bonus. Yeah, with somebody, you know, you don't have to be everybody's friend, but yeah. They're definitely salty dogs in fire. Yeah. People have seen it all, and they're very disenfranchised by the, the organization, the structure, yeah. the bureaucracy that has just screwed them time and time again because it's the federal government. Yeah. So, like, they, uh, on the person level, the personal level, like, they're, they, they fail in a lot of facets. There's good things about working for the feds, and then there's a lot of negatives. Um, yeah, yeah. And so people have been with the organization for a really long time um, and feel like they've gotten the short end of the stick so many yeah. times. You know, they can have a pretty gnarly attitude sometimes. For sure. Mm-hmm. Right. What kind and of attitude do, yeah. do you need to have to, like, be a firefighter, like, in that kind of line? Well, yeah, dude, I, that's a great question. I mean, I you got to just kind of – got to be reliable and uh, – try and stay positive that's how i look at about it um it's really easy to get negative when you're yeah, like yeah. covered in sweat and dirt and you haven't slept in a bed and you're like hungry and tired and like uh 
everything just seems like it sucks and it's a hundred degrees and you're like, yeah. wow, this is really just not great. Um, so it's like, you could focus on those things or you could try and like have a headspace of like, I'm here with like this other dude or this other chick that I get along with really well. Yeah, it sucks yeah. ass, but like we're having yeah. a good time still, like yeah. we're busting our butts. We're in this like crazy cool, beautiful area. We're like so you know, step foot. Yeah, yeah. So it's like Yeah. Yeah. I guess like you can yeah, you can focus on the negatives or yeah. you can focus yeah. on the positives. And so like if you can like try and like yeah, yeah, really hold on for dear life for those positives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> then, then you. That's then you're gonna like be okay. Gratitude, yeah, is the yeah, attitude. You're right. That's yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, you're like uh, you have a cup of coffee in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> my, my instant cup of coffee. So it just, it's all you got. You gotta hang on to what you love. Um, boots. I want to pass a little question to you because, in a sense, um, you know, we had kind of cooked up this episode before we thought about getting Stu involved. Mm-hmm. Um. So I don't know if you wanted to give like a little background on uh, what's kind of set the stage for modern wildfires as far as like logging and um, political political needs. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so Stu, my background is in rangeland ecology and watershed management. Um, so that's where a lot of the <laughs> ecological information has been coming from is uh, that. So one of the books that I've read not too long ago. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's called The Big Burn. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's, that's a pretty crazy one. Um, but uh, I was in a couple classes, and they were dissecting kind of the impact of that particular period of wild, like, like wildland firefighting and just how devastating those fires could were being at the time. Um, and then we get the implementation of things like uh, a lot more like regulations on preserving the areas and not letting the, and just killing every fire that like rolled through. So immediately getting rid of like wa- like wildland fires, um, creating iconography such as Smokey the Bear starts coming out of there and like campaigns to have everybody like practice the most safe uh, forest fires. And there's an idea that floats around of the there's too much success. We're, we're suffering from the success of the Smokey the Bear like type initiatives of no wildland fires anywhere um, within the general public. I think people who are more into the um, environment, environmental studies, um, range and ecologies, things like that, know the benefits of fires that sweep through forests and sweep through like prairies and stuff like that. But the general public seems to have this notion of Um, what like fires equals bad and we should never have any fire and do you do you think that like because a lot of these fires have been suppressed so hard and there's a ton of overgrowth there's a ton of growth everywhere and that these fires when they do sweep through they're just becoming so much more intense do you think there's some merit to the idea that there's just too much success with killing off firefight like killing off firefight killing off wildland fires yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. That's uh, that's one of those things that where in the in the industry right now, it's like one of the most uh, one of the most talked about things that we're dealing with because we're all trying to. We got all this money from that last infrastructure bill that got passed a, a year ago or something mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, to do fuels reduction mitigation on like a lot of the forests in the West, and so. <laughs> Is that like when Trump said to uh, just rake out all the dead growth? Oh, is that, it's it's so going to work. The it's going to be perfect. Okay, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the, where's my government rake? Yeah, like dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's like, yeah, right. That's, so, yeah, this, this unsustainable logging practices basically created this situation that we're seeing like 100 years later where it's like we're getting these mega fires. Um, and then also the rhetoric behind the f- putting out fires, like you were saying, like Smokey the Bear and like have, I can't remember what the saying was, but it was like every fire out by like 10 a.m. the next morning. I think it was in the Big Burn, that book. I think um, so, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Like the Forest Service was like, we got to we gotta suppress every fire. So that became the narrative and that carried through for a long time. Um, 
yeah, for, I don't know, 80 years or something. And so now we're just kind of getting to the point where it's like in the last like 20 to 30 years, it seems like uh, the, the, the perspective has kind of shifted. And so it's like now it's like some fire good, you know? And so people are starting <laughs> yeah, to like, realize yeah. that like, okay, wait a minute. Uh, we can't just put everything out. Like, because historically the ecosystem is burned in the West, right? Like you're a rainbow, mm -hmm, yeah. you know that. Um, so yeah, now it's, now it's changing and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where we're at in, in the industry. We've, we've, we've come full circle, I guess, we've been created a hundred years worth of problems and it's going to take a hundred years to solve them. That's one of the ones wow. that I've heard that I kind of like, <laughs> I'm like, oh. yeah, we're, we're just slapping band-aids on it right now. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Created a uh, blanket. Uh, in the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, two questions for you, Stu. Kind of a two-parter, two-parter, not that it was one. But um, uh, could you continue? I, I think on the phone we talked about a little bit of the background on how the logging industry affected uh, what has set up this 100 years of Band-Aids and problem solving. And so I'm curious if you could give some context on that. And I'm also curious, like, how, how far into the 100 years of problem solving are we? Uh, there's there's some good information out there on the internet, and I'll I'll just give you my yeah. version of it. Well, that's what we can understand. <laughs> yeah, Perfect. Right. That's what we need here. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, is that you know, it's historically there was a lot of large old growth forest with prairie in between it, and you'd have low intensity fires burning the understory and cleaning up all the dead and down and litter. Um, and so when fires did come through, they were usually ground floor, low intensity, maybe a few trees torch out, um, but it just generally kept the ecosystem really healthy. And it kept like the forest floors sort of clean and uh, uncluttered. And then when we logged the West, to essentially build the West um, through the logging practices, when we replanted all these trees to be the new first gen to like come back, mm -hmm. um, we just like planted a bunch of trees next to each other. So all these trees are coming in super thick and competing right next to each other. So now we have these blankets of like mid generation trees that are just packed really close to each other. Yeah. Couple that with like climate change. Yeah. And if a fire gets established, in the crowns which is like when they when a fire gets up into the tops of the trees they call it a crown fire yeah and it's wind driven it can just like pop from tree to tree because all these trees are just packed in right next right. to each other whereas like traditionally maybe they were really big robust and a little more spread out so that's right. my like layman yeah. no, understanding yeah. of like yeah. why logging had an impact right right one of the and, and of course, part of climate change isn't, isn't just increasing temperature. It's going to be stronger storms. And what's going to come with stronger storms is stronger winds. Mm -hmm. right. right. And lightning bugs. <laughs> how, how are you feeling about modern? These, like, do you think we've gotten the uh, firefighting thing down at this point? Like, do you feel like we're on a good path? Are priorities being set in the right place? What do you see as like where we are? Maybe what the ideal version of suppressing fires looks like? It's a tough yeah. one. Yeah. Um, this is That's also fair. coming from a perspective of somebody who's only been a firefighter for a few years. Right. I'm right. going into my fourth season, so I'm still really new, you know? Yeah, for I'm, sure, for sure. I'm just coming in, so um, yeah, my perspective might be different than somebody who yeah. is more knowledgeable on the subject or somebody who's been in it for a long time. Um, but overall, like, it seems like the bureaucracy is getting in the way of uh, suppression efforts and what it is taking to most effectively fight fires. Because since we're a federal organization, yeah. all of our like main, all the decisions that get made that affect the workforce are made by politicians. And right. as we know, like sometimes there's a disconnect between what politicians <laughs> yeah. think is going to benefit the workforce and what the workforce actually needs. Yeah. 100%. So that would probably be the most simplified yeah. way 
that I can explain it without putting my foot in my mouth. And if this this next question might travel into the same category of not wanting to get to the rounds of foot and mouth, but based on that bureaucracy, like how do you feel like the human element is implemented? Like, do you feel like, um, you know, with two week deployments, do you like is there? Do you think the setup is like good for people? Do you feel like the firefighters are taken care of in the best way they could be taken care of? That's a really hard one. Um, yeah. The short answer would probably be like no, yeah. because the way that the model is set up right now is because firefighters at the federal level are so low paid, mm. they're incentivized to chase overtime in the summer, mm. and because that's how where everybody makes all their money. So if you make most of your money in overtime, you constantly want to be on an incident. So if you're constantly on an incident, what does that do to your relationship uh, with your significant other or your mm -hmm. family? Mm -hmm. You know, what does that do to your mental health if you're constantly mm -hmm. out there getting burned out with those salty dogs that we talked about? You know, <laughs> yeah. and you're out there just eating shit all summer long, yeah, yeah. you know? So that's been mm -hmm. a big push for reform. Well, like one mm -hmm. of those organizations, Grass Loop, grassroots wildlife firefighters right, 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 they've right. been pushing a lot for mental health reform in the industry mm -hmm. because that's like one of the biggest uh biggest shortcomings i think that they're experiencing it's just the way that it's set up just yeah. by design we're incentivized to be a fire and that's like one of the paradoxes that's funny is because yeah. like we're firefighters we're supposed to put it out but we mm -hmm. want it to burn or else we don't make money mm-hmm yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, let's get fire going. Like yeah. What are you saying? Hey, doesn't that seem like a bit of an issue? Uh -huh. Huh. Yeah. And you kind of explained too, um, maybe we can uh, talk about a little of the difference between private versus public firefighters. Because you said like a, a public firm couldn't take lead on a fire because of the potential for corruption, right? That would be a private contractor. Isn't private it? contractor, an yeah. Incident commander on a. I, got you. I believe that's how it how it works. Is that a, a contractor is not allowed to be an incident commander or IC for short on mm -hmm. a incident because they could have a conflict of interest that would promote uh, profits over safety of their a personnel on the incident or. Um, safety of public essentially is what it comes down to. And the thought is that a private or a public contractor, a federal firefighter, state firefighter, what have you, would since they're they have they're not profit motivated. I mean, their paychecks coming no matter what. They're not right. going to have decision making processes that are going to be contrary to safety. Yeah. Gotcha. Um... Bouncing back a little bit to our what we were discussing about, like the human element, are, do you feel like do you have concern for long term health effects? Is that something that's being talked about? Like, it feels like time and time again, a cer certainly people who have like worked in high risk environments for the government, maybe they get paid well in that that moment, but healthcare seems to be the one thing, like you mentioned, that gets lost. And of course, you know, there's a concern of smoke and inhalation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does that does that Go, on, go into your mind or is that something that's talked about in the industry? It is some, yeah, I mean, it is. Or is, is, is there, there like a proven like track, track record of health, health issues, issues as well? well. Like, like There is, I mean, it's like people experience higher uh, rates of cardiac arrests that are in this yeah. industry and smoke inhalation does lend itself to various types of cancers. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the time though, it really is kind of like old boys club mentality from what I've mm -hmm. experienced, where it's like, if you're eating smoke, like, deal with it, you know? Mm -hmm. That's changing, and it should be changing, like, for the better, you know? Yeah. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Sure, for sure. Especially, like, if you're on a prescribed fire, mm -hmm. uh, and you're holding, mm -hmm. or they're doing a back burn on an incident, and you're holding... Um, you could be like eating a lot of smoke, just like basically be in a cloud of it that's just blowing yeah. into you. And you just kind of are just suffering through that. Um, and then it doesn't really get 
talked about as much as it like could be. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it really depends on your overhead. Some mm -hmm. uh, some leaders that are are much more uh, willing to to recognize the the coughs that it has on people's uh, health than others. I mm -hmm. would guess it would come down to basically the leadership level and like mm -hmm. whether or not they're like, okay, you guys get out of the smoke. You've been in there for for too long, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then other leaders maybe. We just be like, I deal with it. I dealt with it, you know, for 30 mm -hmm. years. Like, I used car. Do you have any predictions for this upcoming fire season? Like, do you, do people, are there, like, are there general predictions? Do people have an idea of certain weather patterns or what, what might, what you might be facing? Um, I can't really speak to that personally, but there are resources uh, yeah. available um, that, uh, Let's see, the Predictive Services Outlook. If you look that up, type that into Google, yeah. it'll give you, I don't know, what the, is it NIFSI? Uh, one of the organizations that does predictive services for fire will release outlooks for the months of the summertime and well, all through the year, but uh, it'll release a, uh, like a fire danger, essentially uh, rating for how dry it's gonna be and how likely they, they think that fires are going to burn in certain geographic areas of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and they'll release those throughout the month. So that would be a great resource to check that out For if sure. you're trying to get an idea of where it's going to be hottest, where they think it's going to be hottest and burn the most in different mm -hmm. months of the summer going on. Um, you might have seen that before, Boots. I don't know if you're ever... I think I've... Yeah, I've played a little bit around with some of those softwares. Um... I think what's the one I have downloaded here on my laptop is uh, Behavior Plus, uh, which is just another one of those mapping out. But that's more built for prescription fires. A lot of the focus that we had was prescription fires, which I kind of wanted to follow up with, with because mm -hmm. um, you talked about prescription fire a little bit earlier. Um, do you guys do more prescription fire or for like uh, mitigating problems that could be foreseen within like the national forests that you're in? Or is it just um, once the incident starts, then you're on the site doing the work. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll try and do my best. Uh, I'm not involved in prescribed fire like okay. almost ever, except for when my overhead would be like, hey, they're burning a plot over here. Do you guys want to go help? You know, and they mm -hmm. just kick us out and we go support whatever their plan is. So I'll preface my answer with that. Um, Basically, what they need to do is they need to, like, get a plot, and then they create, like, a burn plan, I'm pretty sure. And then from that burn plan, they need to be in a prescription window, which is, like, a certain temperature, time of year, and fuel moisture in order to light it off. And then once everything's in place, and it's the right RX, so prescription, then they'll burn that specific piece of land that they already had this whole plan drawn out for. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Again, not like a dedicated prescribed <laughs> fire guy. Mm -hmm. um, and that typically happens in the shoulder seasons. So when you say um, shoulder that season, sense. that's like in the spring or in the fall. When okay. it's not like cranking hot and the, right. and the fuels are not like completely dried out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's going to get started in my neighborhood in uh, Tahoma, California. In the spring, they'll do, be doing some prescribed burns. Um, <clears throat> yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, I always think it's interesting, too, that, like, you know, before all this started, the indigenous people of the country just were intuitively were, like, into wildfires and even used it as a hunting strategy, which is something we covered in our white-tailed deer episode, mm -hmm. where they might burn, like, 17 acres, drive the animals out to a lake, and then, like, snare them, strangle them, drown them, and they would come back with, like, a major haul, like, 20 deer, a couple bears, some raccoons, and, like, yeah. And now, of course, like, just could you imagine if, like, people were like, yeah, we're going to, Go hunting, so we're gonna burn about seventeen acres. acres. We're trying, trying to get, get you know, know thirty, 30 bucks, bucks, three, three black. <laughs> right. My my uh, my, oh my, my times, times have changed. changed. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. That they, that yeah, absolutely though. That they were doing it 
long before the colonials yeah. showed up. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. yep. just as healthy. These actually these tree species respond when we burn the forest floor. So they're yeah. just starting fires. Yeah, and, like you know, planting crops yeah. um, in burn scars because you know they were in tune with the land that they lived on. So yeah, yeah very interesting stuff. Um, I would definitely like to learn more about that for sure. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, it is pretty interesting. And now we're just dealing with like this whole, uh, this whole like, yeah, colonialist impression of on the land that we're like yeah. you know, in charge of it and we're on it and it's working for us instead of working with it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This, this Western, Western perspective. perspective. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, like what, what, what do you, do you think, think people need to know? know general misconceptions, kind of like anything you want to add that like would be good to have in the public's consciousness that right. needs to be on people's radar or what you, what right. information you think could be helpful to have? I would say like understanding, <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, difficulties that the workforce is facing right now and just kind of Mm -hmm. highlighting that in the public eye would benefit most firefighters and that means like our uh struggles with pay yeah um, and retention yeah in our workforce is like two of the chief like complaints that we're dealing with right now and the things that we're battling like essentially equivalency wise we're not getting paid on the same level as a state employee or Mm -hmm. a municipal firefighter that works for like a department Mm -hmm. in a city you know um yeah we're getting paid pittance compared to them and so because of that people in the forest service and Mm -hmm. in other federal agencies um Mm -hmm. are leaving in you know record numbers because they're like i can't support my family i'm forced to chase fires all summer long my mental health is deteriorating Mm -hmm. and so i am gonna go be a you know an electrician and make right make some real money money. every night you know retire Mm -hmm. myself yeah Yeah, so then we it it comes down to like okay are you guys going to make this a competitive salary so that we can actually retain people who have been in this for 10 12 years like that minimal management area Mm -hmm. Yeah. of people who have a decade of experience they're irreplaceable because yeah. they're the people who are still operationally active they haven't gotten so high in the chain of command that they're kind of off the fire you know and they're mm-hmm. making big mm-hmm. term decisions they're mm-hmm. still in like operational roles on fires mm-hmm. and they're they're leaving because they need more money you know and, mm-hmm. and they need a better work-life balance so yeah if i had to highlight anything it would be pay and retention and mental health are just like some of the things we're really struggling with right now and hoping that uh if uh legislation gets passed that help yeah it sounds like uh, a really manipulative strategy from our leadership because they need you to work so many hours they need to manipulate you into taking over time and just really chase that which is Mm -hmm. just going to be detrimental to your just yeah, not good at all. Yeah. It basically would be, would be great if I think like what I'm gathering is like it would be great if people cared about wildfires as a subject that they were like thinking about more than just their property damage or more than just like oh it's going to suck to see this but really understanding what's happening to people is really really important. Right. Um, it's like yeah, it's the impact that it has on the ecosystem is really big. Most people don't really even think about a wildfire until that they're breathing in gnarly smoke in August, you know, and they're like, mm-hmm. you can't go outside and mountain bike because yeah. until, until you're there, until you understand AQI is it. like 300 parts per million, you know, and I can't go yeah. outside. It's like, this yeah. Stuff. And then they think, you know, and then you think about wildfire and you're like, you know, what are they doing out there? Why don't they put, why don't they put this shit yeah. out? Hey, my home's gonna burn, mm-hmm. but there's there's larger aspects than just property damage, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll work mm-hmm. on it. Let me know. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's real. Um, I know 
you know, you're you're definitely in the fresh phase of wildfire fighting. But like, I'm gonna ask you for another prediction. It's totally cool if it's still like a mystery. But do you have any like macro, like big picture predictions for the West and what this like next? Again, this is definitely a big, complicated question. What this next hundred years could look like? Like, I'm curious. Like, is this an inevitable um, desertification of the West as we currently just try and suppress fires so no, we don't lose everybody's property all at once? And should the East Coast expect this future because it's a totally different vibe? I mean, from time to time, there's smoke in our in the East Coast. More and more, it's not something I ever saw growing up. But over this last summer, there was major burns in New Jersey. I'm not, you know, it was it was an art. Somebody started that burn. It wasn't naturally occurring, and I don't think it's gonna it was nearly as detrimental. You know, looking at the acreage, I remember I was in Tahoe looking at these really large fires with terrible air quality. And at the same time, there was some burns in New Jersey, which, you know, just wasn't on my radar growing up at all. Um, so do you think the East Coast is in store for some more wildfires? And do you think the West is getting out of this one alive? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I'm asking you if the country is about to be destroyed. So let me know. So no pressure on answering this one accurately or anything. I'm sure it's not going to affect anybody's mental health or well-being. Yeah. Well, they look at you. So just nothing but positive vibes here. <laughs> yeah, this, I I know nothing about the East yeah. Coast, like that's so geology, bad. geography. Like I've never even been past Chicago, so I'll start oh, come through some sometime. Uh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I need I need to come check it out. Really, for sure, um, make it happen. The West. I mean, that's that's another big question. I'm sure there's people out there that have yeah. a have studied this for years yeah. and have like a way more nuanced answer than I could give. Yeah. But what I will say, like from my layman perspective is yeah. right now, it doesn't look good. It looks yeah. like we're slapping a bandaid on pretty much everything when yeah. it comes to how we're managing the forests. Yeah. We're, we're behind the power curve from an aviation yeah. stance. If that makes sense. Like we're, yeah. we're, uh, we're responding instead of, like reacting it's mm -hmm. almost like reacting instead of a real response it's all reactionary which of course we're like you know finish finish oh um yeah and of course we're re reacting in a way that also uses a ton of energy a ton of oil to power helicopters trucks food chainsaws like so it's like it does feel just like band-aids because i uh it's just because of course what we need is major structural change we need it like It'd be great if society be like slowed down and we're like, oh, we got to figure out, let's, you know, banking, economy, that's always going to be there. Let's figure out the forest fire thing for a bit. Let's focus on that and slow down. But, well, if they made it a competitive wage and they yeah. hired a bunch of people because people are like, whoa, this is a great job. I could be outside, you know, yeah. I make good money. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, they made people less dependent on OT, so you have a better work-life balance and you could yeah. hire a on more people to do okay. fuels mitigation in the West. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are all like, these are all like things that just seem intuitive, you know, but like there's so much in between like where we are now and that actually happening that it's like, oh, it's like, it seems insurmountable. You know, if they wanted to make all those decisions and all that stuff got passed and there was money mm -hmm. there for these government agencies to do essentially mm -hmm the thing that makes the most sense mm -hmm. then yeah like you know what maybe we could make like a pretty profound impact on the west in terms of like fuels mitigation and like doing the burns that we need to do and like cleaning up the ground floor in the forest so that the fires burn less intense and then doing you know prep work for cut a fuel break around while in urban interfaces so that when fires do happen you know they're Hopefully they don't destroy as much property and don't threaten life at the same level they do right now. So it's like, if we wanted to make these decisions, like we could, but it's like, you know, then there's politics and bureaucracy and all these levels yeah. um, in the way right now. Right. Just like, you know, most things in the world where it's like, yeah, we, we see how we could solve a problem, you know, yeah. but we're... Mm -hmm. But like, are people actually going to like take those right. steps, you know, because like, right. what's it for me? Like, 
how do I get a new lift on my yacht for my jet ski? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start giving you guys more money. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think you mentioned this to me earlier too, where, you know, the criticism is it's just not a quote unquote profitable industry. You know, you're not making a product, which of course I would argue you are, which you're going to be making sustainable forests, mm -hmm. which could even be profitable in tourism you know, adding national parks and protecting national parks and whatnot. But uh, um, that's a good perspective. I didn't think yeah. about it like that. That's, yeah. this is the way that that, the point you just brought up was yeah. a, a dude that I worked with who's been in it for a long time. So mm -hmm. he has a pretty like healthy nuanced perspective. He basically yeah. told me, he's like, think about it. When these people who are making these decisions for us, politicians, you know, lifelong bureaucrats or whatever, at the really highest levels of government, that trickle down to what we're doing. Um, they're they're looking at us and they're saying, "What do they make? We don't make shit. We just like we just suppress fires. We actually cost the government right. a ton of money. You mm -hmm. know, like we're just costing them money. And so they look at it. They're like, "Why do we want to pay more into something that just costs us more money? They don't produce anything. We don't make stuff. You mm -hmm. know. So it's like people can't see." the long-term benefit in funding an effort like this. They just see the short-term incentives, you know, like yeah. why would we pour a bunch of money into something when it's not going to benefit us right now? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, don't know. I, I thought it was a really interesting point. I was like, dang, dude, I never thought about it like that. <laughs> like, <"All right." laughs> yeah. 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 I think, I think a perspective shift is necessary and I, I, you know, I don't think, we can be too, it's not realistic to have an idealistic perspective of like, you know, what I would love to see is commerce and industry and like take a stop, reflect and actually slow down. But it, you know, the only, the only way to do, I think to do this is probably to like prove that it's a financially good decision and, um, you know, convince, convince our capitalistic uh, overlords that they could make money on it just uh you know for for the few of us that think about the next generations actually it's probably the great majority of people but of course you know yeah we just don't have the power to the people mm -hmm. and, uh, i think i think the current environment is the reflection of that unfortunately um, <laughs> so maybe we, maybe we can all put our heads together and figure out how to convince convince people that this is a good profitable decision um, for us. Yeah, because money is the power. Money is the religion of the uh, of the overlords. I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, Stu, I really appreciate you coming on. Boots, did you yeah. have anything you want to ask before we wrap I guess things up? Last thing, uh, Stu, if if someone wants to get involved or mm -hmm. get involved with uh, even like local wildland fighting, like, um, volunteer services and stuff like that. How, how would they go about doing that? Good question. What I would say is the easiest way that you could do that is go on to Reddit and go to the subreddit wildfire. And there's a sticky post on that subreddit from a mod that is like how to get a job in wildland fire, because it's typically a, somewhat like heinous process and that's another thing that the government's really struggling with is streamlining that and like trying to make that a little more user friendly um so if you're interested i would say take those steps um a brief overview of the process is if you were going to get a try to get a job as a federal firefighter in wildland you would go make an account on usa jobs and then you would apply with your resume to different forestry technicians, forestry technician positions um, at different places around the US, wherever you wanted to go. And then you would wait to hear back from uh, hiring managers um, and essentially start that process like that. The, the crazy thing is, is that they open those position windows in like September. And then those, you'll start that job in May of next of the following year. So it's like the, the HR system in uh, the USDA and the DOI um, is a little archaic. 
and from what I've heard from other people who've been in it, it's a revolving door. Um, so it's a tough, tough uh, system that people are trying to learn. Like they get into it, they have to learn it, and then they're like, wow. And it, they, they just get backlogged essentially without trying to get too muddy in the waters. And so it's, it's a difficult system. You got to start in it early and make sure that you get your application in during the window and then you just wait and monitor your email. And when you get an email, act on it quickly. Go take through the proper steps in USA Jobs and uh, contact the hiring manager and the soup for the crew that you're trying to get on. I would say that's probably one of the biggest things. Check that sticky post on Wildfire subreddit and then once you finally get through all that, and you're in the system, you're in the system to be hired, call the soup of the crew that you want to get on and ask them, you know, like, what do I do to get hired by you? Because you, they've got a list, like, a hundred people deep, you know, and it's just names. But if you call them, you know, express interest, then it'll mm -hmm. set you apart. Um, and they're, you know, they can put a voice to a name, you know, or even better show up at the station and be like, hey, you know, I'm this person, you know, can I work for you? What's your deal? What's this whole place about, you know? And so that'll really set you apart. Um, so yeah, that's, that's another thing that the HR they're, they're struggling with and learning to navigate USA jobs and learning to kind of get through that system is it's its own beast. Um, but yeah, again, wildfire subreddit, It'll give you a list, step-by-step -step list. Somebody made it uh, a few years ago, I think in like 2018, and it is, it's money. So go check that out if you're interested. Perfect. Sweet. Thank you so um, much for our, yeah. all our listeners out there. If you have time, I have one more little question. Or do you, do you yeah, go one? for it. Okay. And do you have any recommendations versus uh, going through a federal agency versus a private a agency, private contracting agency? Um. Have you, you noticed know, any difference you know, between like work, work, work life balance, balance, human, human safety, safety, whatnot? I, I mean, I, I can't really speak to working for a contractor, um, right. because I've only ever worked for state and federal governments. Um, but I would say everybody gets their start somewhere. So it's like, yeah. if you find a job opening with a contractor and you think that it's going to work out for you, um, in your in your life that summer, take that job. You know, if you get hired by a federal or state entity and uh, you make it through all that crazy application process um, and pop out the other side, you have the job, then take that. Um, I would say, yeah, if, if you're trying to get into it, take what you can get. Cause sometimes it's hard to get your foot in the door in this. So just, uh, yeah, call around start making phone calls it sucks but you just have to cold call people to yeah. like get hired in the industry um yeah. and usually people are really you know just trying to help you out yeah yeah mm -hmm. i think people really respect the cold call i found even in like the film industry i think people respect people who've got some guts mm -hmm. yeah 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 because yeah, cold calling sucks yeah you just i know you, you're just assuming you're annoying the shit out of someone <laughs> like hello Hi, my name's the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's sometimes it's just what it takes. All right. Well, Stu, thank you again for coming on. Yes. I really appreciate it. Super yeah. excited to, uh, to, uh, yeah. To put, put this, this out there and get a little education, education out there. there. Yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll hope, hopefully, hopefully I'll see you, you soon, soon out, out west. west. Looking, Looking forward to that. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's, let's we'll, meet up. Let's make we'll a trip. Be in touch. We'll, we'll be in touch. touch. Yeah, yeah, I'd love yeah. that. Yeah, um, thanks for having me on, gentlemen. I yeah, hope that course. monologue and ramble at you guys too much. No, <laughs> no I think that freaking You slapped. did great. Yeah, it you was great. great. Yeah, I think uh, it's nice that, to put things in terms that people are actually going to understand. So I, mm -hmm. I actually really appreciate it. that you were able to do that for us. Right, right, right. Cool. Well, Tom, right. thanks, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great thanks meeting you. Yeah. On for a bit and we'll close this thing out. out. Yeah, we'll close this out. All right, All right. Salutations, salutations to be well. Good right. luck on your first day of work, work tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Cheers, gentlemen. Yeah. I'll cheers. Cheers. All, right. All right. Cheers. Hi, Boots. Hi, Tom. <laughs> How the hell are you? <laughs> We're doing good. We're doing <laughs> yeah. good. You have a nice time in Denver last week? 
I did. I did. Good. Good. good yep. Good. And how's Philly? Amazing. So good yeah. to be home. Oh my God, moisture, dude. This shit's no. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you tell it, me you're you don't. It's so humid. Oh. What? Your skin's not just drying out when you walk outside. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's kind of wild. Yeah, I don't wake up with dead skin all over my face every morning. <laughs> yeah, I was in Dallas, Texas for a couple of days, and oh my gosh, humidity is wild. It's a wild thing, but no, it's really nice here. Spring has sprung just, just as I got here. So it's just oh. like all kind, totally different tree species, flowers, grass is green just no desert switches we love it we love to see it yeah um yeah no things are good so what'd you make of that podcast did you or that interview did you feel like you learned something about uh i did i i I don't know many uh, wildland firefighters um so i think it was great to get that inside perspective hearing what it's actually like um yeah i think it's one of those positions that people can you know, they see the videos on the news when they mm-hmm. talk about, like, the California fires. Mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. They, they see it, but they don't hear about it. Right. Until you talk to someone who's part of it, it's really hard to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, I think right there we got a beautiful episode. and um, Yeah, great really, interview. Really happy. Our first interview, which is really cool. And I think mm-hmm. that's what a really that was a really great guest to get started with. Yeah. Um, so thank you for tuning into this beautiful episode of the Made for Walking podcast. Exactly. Uh, I've been Boots. You've been I, Tom. I've been Tom. Don't <laughs> set fire to your lawn. Yeah, yeah. Leave it to the professionals. I, that was not an invitation to go start <laughs> fire, forest fires. I guess maybe a couple tips in prevention would be to just look up, always keep an eye on guidelines in your local area. If you're traveling, be aware of those guidelines. Especially if you're coming from the East Coast, you know, you don't, if it's summertime or fall, you don't just have an invitation to start a campfire while you're camping. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be the beginning of a disaster in your face on the news and federal charges brought against you. So, um, if you're going backpacking, doing any sort of camping and stuff like that, make sure the area you're in is not in danger of any uh, wildfires. Don't want to be stuck in that kind of scenario. Yeah, have an eye on where those fires are on. It's not, it's, you know, it's going to be a liability for yourself and it's going to be a liability for people like Stu, you know, not Stu himself, but like the people who would have to come in and rescue you. So that would put a lot of lives at risk. So, you know, when traveling to Europe, there's the concept of don't be the dumb American, you know, understand Mm -hmm. the culture and be polite and, you know, try and, and you'll have a better time. I think the same thing goes in for the West Coast, you know understanding that culture and don't don't become a problem there Mm -hmm. respect respect that area and yeah knowing knowing those fire patterns are going to keep you and your loved ones alive because all it takes is one change in wind direction Mm -hmm. so you're going to want to know where that wind's blowing and even it's not blowing that way now just knowing okay if that wind shifts what's going to happen to me right like how long do i have to get out yeah yeah say just don't if if it's too risky don't don't do it yeah yeah you really that and the fire season's just getting longer and longer and Mm -hmm. you know i would say you start to lose air quality you from what i've seen is like by august you're going to start seeing some major dips in air quality and by fall i would say like you basically don't want to travel out here if you don't have to because it it does turn into a bit of a survival scenario for i think a decent number of the western western states yes as someone in a western state who's lived there their whole lives would you agree with that statement oh yeah say hearing fires all the time on the news i mean waking up with smoke everywhere a couple years ago i mean it was raining ash i mean it 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 happens it It, it happens it's it's a lot closer than you think and it and it happens really quickly it happens Mm -hmm. with that one shift of wind that one unexpected Mm -hmm. storm you just can't constantly predict the movement of nature and you certainly can't consistently battle the moves of nature yeah it was certainly a jarring experience for me moving to tahoe for a Mm -hmm. fire season and yeah huge major dips in air quality i wasn't going outside for you know weeks at a time which was rough while i was living in my truck Mm -hmm. but luckily some really nice people you know allowed me to share their home with them during that time um but 
yeah, I would say, like you said, raining ash, constantly raining ash. You know, I was cleaning ash off my car all the time. Um, so I, I would say, predictably, it, the fire seasons will just get worse and worse. Um, yeah. Because it's just going to dry out more stuff. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. Yeah. And then post-fire season, it can, and if there's any, like, big rainfalls or anything like that, can lead to some other issues with mudslides and flooding since the yeah. soil becomes hydrophobic yeah. so that's been you know, big in tahoe yeah you've been you having a lot of landslides. mudslides landslides mudslides i'll tell you what the other day um so you know i just flew back east and i flew out of reno mm -hmm. and i so all of a sudden i realized i had to leave reno a day early because another snowstorm was coming in and i didn't want to have to deal with i-80 which is a really you know three thousand feet of elevation change plot or whatever oh yeah at super intense road to deal with in the summer or winter you know constant jack nice of trucks and stuff so i'm like all right i'll get out of here a day early which was you know a little stressful trying to close up shop a day earlier than i expected uh so i'm kind of rushing around i get on the road and i'm driving on uh, 89 for all you locals and um which is that basically is the road that circles the lake and gets you to the highway and I see some road flares, see some lights, and I'm like, oh, okay, what are we walking into here? Am I about to put that woofer to work? Mm -hmm. um, but luckily nobody was hurt, but there was a big-ass boulder in the road in the middle of the night. And it's just, you know, that's, that's major. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not the first time I've had to deal with something like that. You know, if, if they hadn't stopped and shined a light on and got people slowing down, I'm, you know, that could have killed me, hurt somebody, you know. So. Mm -hmm those environmental changes there was another night where i had already been stuck in the house for like a week and i knew the weather we were having really fluctuating temperatures so i knew snow melt was going to just start causing some problems and sure enough i'm on my way home from the climbing gym i just double check instagram to see if a uh, trucky chp has posted anything about roads and sure enough like three or four tree fell three or four trees fell on my route home and i, I got delayed going home that night so, yes, I can attest to the landslides and the danger of that. Yeah. It, it, fires don't just burn stuff up. It causes a yeah. lot of issues everywhere. Right. Right. And, you know, this has definitely been like a strange winter for moisture, mm -hmm. which hopefully is a good thing. Like we were saying, like, hopefully that leaves Tahoe, like California with some more water. But what that could also be an indication of is, you know, just an intense storm pattern. So yeah. even with that water, I you know that could be high winds, that could be more lightning. Yeah, there's, there's it's we'll getting see. crazy out here. Yeah, it's Remember, wild times. It, the difference between weather and climate is so key, right? Yes, like, yes, it is getting hotter. That is also bad. Yes, um, and it's also just going to come with bigger storms. I think. Yeah. You know? Yep. Think bigger storms. We all kind of know. Longer seasons, so longer summers, longer winters are going to be occurring. Yeah, yeah it's just, it's going to be it's going to be different. It's going to be wild. Yeah. I think in some ways there has been the sensationalization, sensationalization, sensationalizing, sensationalizing. The sensationalizing, yeah, that's yeah. It, right. Let's go with it. Yeah, roll with it. Roll with it. <laughs> there has been the sensationalizing of climate change in some ways, as you know. There has been the sensationalizing of climate change to use as a political pawn. I think, and yeah, it's like, okay, so Florida maybe won't be underwater in 20 years, but it also might be. It is. Did like, you see it, those videos? Of yeah, I know. Like you're just looking at me oh. like, Tom, it wasn't sensationalizing. <laughs> but like, this shit's so real. And like, we're yeah. going to see, this is it. These are the weather patterns changing right now. We mm. are in this thing. Yeah, all these tornadoes that I've been seeing, they've yeah. been crazy out there. Yeah. This is the whole climate beginning to change. So yes, um, I don't know. It just feels super pertinent to me to see some major societal shifts. So yeah. I hope we got somewhere today with just like understanding a perspective. Someone, even though you know he's only a couple years in, he's he, he knows I think he it's, he knows he's in it. He's in it. And so, that's the that's the major thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm really grateful to know Stu. Really grateful to know you. Oh, I'm so the, grateful uh, to meet Stu. Thank you for introducing us. Yeah, Great. Grateful yeah. to know you too, Tom. Yeah, it's so good that we do have a platform where we can, you know, at least try. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think I think fire fires are just 
they're part of nature. Um, I think yeah. we've been seeing a lot more of them on the news uh, over the past couple of years, um, more in the national coverage of news. Um, I know growing up in Colorado and why and stuff, you, you mm-hmm. see about the fires all the time, but right. these big California fires, those big fires that sweep multiple states and stuff, I think you're starting to see them. People are starting to talk about it everywhere, and I think yeah. I think uh, I think that's starting to open up people's eyes to the intensity and kind of necessity of people helping out with that. Yeah, it reminds me of the old adage, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second mm-hmm. best time is now. Yeah. In the same way, the best way to deal with this problem was, uh, you know, over 100 years ago. Mm-hmm. But the second best time would be now. Yeah. So if we're just yeah. we're just doing second best. Still, and still, which is the best. We might just survive if we play our cards right at second best. Hey, um, there we go. Yeah, so. But thank you for listening to the number yeah. one best. Best. <laughs> comedic Com- animal commodification <laughs> oh and otherwise environmental <laughs> issue podcast. We're working on this little kid. For our <laughs> With our own. Thanks for tuning in. I yeah. uh, hope you learned something. I've been Boots. I've been Tom. You have a great one. <laughs>